Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on agriculture and energy. I think it's a very important topic and a well-timed discussion. My name is Janet Wood. I'm the editor of New Power Report, and I'm going to be your chair for this event. A few words about the format. We'll hear from three expert speakers, um, and uh, in between, we will ask any quick questions of clarification. Um, uh, they will speak for 10 or 15 minutes each. At the end of that time, we'll have plenty of time for discussion, um, and I will be chairing that um, when we get to that point. But if you do have questions, you don't have to wait um, until, uh, until we get to the discussion to submit them. You can email your questions in at any time and just use the button at the bottom of your screen to send us, send us those, and then we'll get into them when we get to the discussion. Okay, I won't hold up the information any longer. Let me just pass straight on to our first speaker, who is uh, Ross Murray from the CLA. Ross. Janet, thank you very much, and a very good afternoon to everybody. Uh, Ross Murray. Uh, I'm a landowner and a charter surveyor by profession, uh, and I'm Deputy President of the CLA. We're the membership organisation for rural businesses, landowners and land managers uh, throughout England and Wales. Uh, we have 33,000 members, a growing membership. We represent about 10 million farmed acres, uh, and our business is really to... to lobby uh, and um, spread influence uh, not only in Westminster but also in Cardiff and increasingly in Europe because of the European dimension and we have a very strong track record and history on renewable energy. Uh, the challenge to um, agriculture and land managers uh, is enormous um, and, and essentially it is a pressure to produce more, uh, more food from less land as environmental pressures grow and indeed as land gets used for other uses. Uh, and society uh, needs to balance conflicting demands of food security, economic and environmental considerations in, in, in all sort of policy formulation. Um, we live in a world of um, dominated by cheap food policy. The successive governments have really pursued this. Uh, and food must be readily available, uh, cheap, and with uh, increasingly uh, minimal environmental impact. There is a, an increasing consumer requirement that the environment is taken into account as we produce food. And so th th these conflicting demands are sometimes uh, quite difficult to reconcile. Um, but I must make the point to, to everybody who's not a farmer or a land manager uh, that the profit is essential. Uh, you can't expect food security um, without a viable um, farm sector. And we have a sort of continual challenge with downward pressure on food prices. But at the same time, we have to remain profitable. Greenhouse gas emissions uh, come mainly fr from energy use um, and you know, on farm uh, you have waste, manures and slurries which produce methane and nitrous oxides uh, and also uh, greenhouse gas emissions come from farm inputs such as fertiliser and fuel. But also um, we need to think about livestock, particularly cows which themselves produce uh, greenhouse emissions. So moving on, how can farmers and land managers uh, meet this challenge? Well, uh, land has to be multifunctional, delivering food, uh, but also energy and environmental services. And also I would put another one which isn't on the slide, which is fun. Um, uh, land is used for public access and recreation, uh, all sorts of um, uh, amusements, uh, in addition to the essential imperative for food. But what my members are increasingly doing is, is turning to energy production um, as a form of diversification. Uh, there is a constant need for what we describe as sustainable intensification <coughs> or smart agriculture. And one example of this is uh, precision farming. And agriculture has to uh, continue to improve on its efficiency and work uh, within what we describe as a circular economy whereby we recover more inputs such as heat and energy. So the role for renewable energy in delivering multiple outputs with reduced environmental impact um, is there and we hope to, for our, our members, the farmers, to provide a diversified and secure uh, income throughout the time. Moving on to opportunities, uh, there are multiple opportunities <coughs> for renewables at all scales on agricultural land in Britain and it really depends on elevation, uh, whether you're on the east or the west of the country and the type of land. 
but the, the, the opportunities uh, go through a range of different technologies which are shown uh, on the live view before you. Um, firstly, the opportunity to produce electricity through solar PV, whether it's on, on roofs, um, or buildings, or ground mounted. Electricity from wind, uh, through hydro, or anaerobic digestion. Secondly, the opportunity to produce heat <coughs> through biomass. Increasingly, the poultry sector is using biomass to heat uh, chicken sheds. Solar, uh, which can produce hot water. Uh, heat pumps, uh, likewise. And then anaerobic digestion. Uh, there is an opportunity there not only to produce methane, but through the installation of heat exchangers. Um, and, and this large natural engine can produce hot water for a variety of uses. And it's important to consider how renewables can be most effectively and appropriately integrated uh, onto uh, individual farms, and this will vary uh, from site to site. So moving on, is there a conflict between renewables and food production? It's an area of frequent discussion, <coughs> not a little controversy from time to time. For instance, the Secretary of State Liz Truss recently commented about solar. Um, the government has, has signaled they don't like um, large solar parks on agricultural land. They believe that it displaces food production. Uh, my members would not necessarily agree with that, but that is the government's direction of travel on solar, and the emphasis now through public policy is to concentrate on roof-mounted solar energy. Renewable energy provides opportunity for multiple outputs. Um, and uh, two examples. Firstly, uh, going back to solar, is, is the opportunity to graze beneath solar farms. Um, that is clearly uh, killing two birds with one stone. And secondly, anaerobic digestion, uh, the production of methane, could also produce heat, but it could also produce digestate, which is extremely good fertilizer for the land. There are potential for all sorts of biodiversity benefits um, uh, through the production of uh, renewable energy, um, and essentially what it does is it protects economic viability of farming, and it allows an investment in a whole range of, of, of new technologies, which is incredibly important. Let's just have a look at on-farm uh, anaerobic digestion. Uh, DEFRA figures from 2012 uh, estimate that 90 million tons of manures and slurries are produced um, on farms uh, in England alone and only a very small percentage of that is actually harvested into anaerobic digestion so the opportunity is absolutely massive and you're effectively creating energy displacement whereby heat uh, and power and fuel production as well as dig digestate is all there uh, and, and we see a reduced fuel cost Anaerobic digestion can tackle the three main sources of agricultural emissions uh, from the slurries and manures. Uh, it can produce energy and it can produce fertilizers. What are the barriers to renewable energy that we see? Well, first of all is um, uh, the most complicated part of the whole process is assessing uh, feasibility. Uh, it's complicated and it needs very, very good advice and no one should go into these projects lightly because uh, they are often massive capital investments. So uh, having, having a really good uh, appraisal at the beginning of a project is, is, is absolutely critical. Secondly, grid connection. Uh, we all are aware of, of, of problems with the grid uh, and, uh, you know, th th this is in many instances a barrier to uh, renewable energy. Planning, the old chestnut, um, whatever the direction of travel in government policy on renewable energy, one's got to convince firstly one's neighbours uh, and then the local planning authority and ultimately the planning inspectorate if your project uh, is going to meet uh, the demands of society and the policy background. Fourthly, permitting, and this is generally the uh, environment agency um, who are the, the government's sort of um, uh, statutory authority on many of the permits required for renewable energy. No pushover whatsoever, and, and rightly so. And, um, you know, the individual applicant will have to ensure that their proposal fits with that. And then finally, of course, um, finance and the ability to raise capital in the, in, in, in the capital markets uh, is essential because so often these projects will be done on, on borrowed money and uh, they are, as I said earlier, um, large capital uh, requirements. 
So in conclusion, renewables shouldn't be seen um, as a threat to traditional agriculture in, in any way at all, but it's an opportunity for sustainable intensification of United Kingdom farming. Increasingly important for us to deliver multiple outputs from land, both food and fuel, and the key is that it must be uh, economically and environmentally uh, sustainable. So that is uh, my conclusion. Thank you very much indeed for your attention, and I shall now hand back to Janet. Thanks very much, Ross. Very interesting to hear the, uh, the overview from the, uh, from the landowning and farming side. Let me um, hand over now to Ian Watt from Forum from the Future, who's going to take a look at, uh, at uh, what potential we have out there. Ian, over to you. Thanks very much, Janet, um, and thanks you, thank you, Ross, as well. Uh, if anyone out there is expecting a feisty debate, I should probably warn you in advance that I'm going to be saying, covering quite similar territory with similar conclusions to Ross, uh, but from a slightly different angle. Um, Forum for the Future, we're a, a, a sustainable development charity. Uh, we tend to work in long-term partnerships uh, with, with companies and other large organisations and are increasingly turning towards um, cross-sectoral collaborations to try and uh, I, I guess bring about large scale tackle tricky sustainability issues um, hence we have put together uh, with a, a few other organisations this Farm Power Project what I'm going to do today is tell you a bit about what we're up to tell you a bit about the research we've done recently which has been exploring the potential for farms to contribute to the energy system and hopefully um, entice some of you on the call to perhaps get involved with the project um, First slide just introduces Forum, uh, not much more to say than what I've said already, so I will skip forward. Uh, this slide shows the organisations that comprise the steering committee for the Farm Power Project. Um, it actually began with just some serendipitous conversations between ourselves, Farmers Weekly and Nottingham Trent University, uh, but we've now built uh, what we think is quite an interesting steering committee of involving all the organisations uh, on the screen just now. Um, what I guess really brought the group together, why we banded together was th this idea that despite the pioneering efforts of some, and we know that farmers and landowners and rural communities more broadly are out there exploring the potential of energy, it still felt to all of us that the overall potential um, for farms and rural communities to contribute to the energy system remained untapped. And if there's a, a way to maybe summarize that up, it, it seems to us that farmers are finding ways to invest in renewables despite the system rather than because of the system. Um, and our plan as part of this project is to try and do something about that. Uh, so these are the broad aims of, of the, the project. Um, a rather grand aim we've, we've given ourselves is just actually to bring about a step change in the uptake of sustainable farm-based energy across the UK with three particular focus areas. The first one is to explore and outline the potential role that farms could and should play within the energy system. Uh, and we just released a report two Fridays ago that, that covers some of that. That's available on Forum's website, if, and I'll some, uh, mention some of the summary findings shortly. Uh, we have also been looking into the barriers to the uptake of uh, farm-based energy systems and also thinking about ways around those and the plan now moving forward with the project now that we have uh, got, uh, got a research and are, are confident in saying that farms could be playing a significant role is to actually develop a series of work streams to try and tackle some of those barriers and I'll come to those towards the, the end of my chat. Um, at the risk of being somewhat duplicative, duplicative with uh, Ross, just some of the key barriers that we've noticed uh, against similar territory uh, uh, different order this time round, so I've gone with the economic barriers up front, um, and again, energy investments do tend to involve uh, uh, upfront cost. Um, the message we've got here is can be really quite interesting. We have spoken to some farmers that have told us that finance is readily available, um, but those are farmers that seem particularly skilled in being able to tap into that. And we have also spoken to one or two farmers uh, where it becomes quite clear that they speak to their bank manager and their bank manager only, um, and often if that individual isn't enthusiastic about an investment in energy, that can be at the end of that particular farmer's journey. Um, We've also heard some stories about some quite perverse incomes. One farmer who had got loans from his bank uh, to invest in two highly successful energy projects, when he came to ask a loan for the third, he was actually declined uh, because he was told that for an agricultural business, energy was now taking up, uh, bringing well, it was too large a percentage of his overall income. And that seems somewhat perverse to us, that rather than that farmer being seen as a, a good solid energy investment, it's actually started to count against him. 
the informational barrier is key as well. I think here it's less a case of there being, it's not a case that there's insufficient information, it's almost that there's too much information. Um, I think it's fairly safe to say that uh, farmers tend to be a, a, an inherently untrusting audience when it comes to people trying to sell them something. Um, and often when they, they get such a range of estimates as to the potential of their land and how much it might cost and what the benefits might be, that they end up actually mistrusting um, everybody. This is starting to change in that most farmers now can look over the fence and find a neighbour who has done, done uh, something in the energy space. And uh, again, we found that farmers, farmers trust other farmers more than, more than anyone else. Um, the institutional barriers, again, that's some of the, the policy um, and planning issues that, that have been mentioned earlier as well. That does seem to me in a big picture area that while there is supportive talk from parts of government around small scale and farm based renewables, that tends to be from the relatively disempowered parts of government, to be honest. And there does seem to be a sense that where the power really lies in government, there's very much a sense that the future of energy will continue to involve big centralised kit. Um, and I think that, that, that just general framing of the whole regulatory landscape, uh, I think, needs to change. And then we, too, have also identified the, the grid capacity issue as a, a particularly tricky one for, um, for farmers. Often it's very hard. For, it, it's essentially a luck of the draw to, uh, for any particular farmer in any particular location as to whether or not there is capacity in the network for them to get involved. Um, if there isn't capacity, it's often very prohibitive co um, cost to get connected, and the next farmer down the line has to bear the full cost of upgrading that grid. Perhaps if a large developer was the next uh, investor down the line, they can afford to, to cover that cost, but if it's a small scale, a farmer who's looking to put in a smaller scale uh, scheme, often that really can be prohibitive. Um, what we have just been looking at more recently is, is trying to articulate what we think the size of the prize is. So this report available on Forum's website uh, is called uh, Exploring the Size of the Prize. And what we have done is looked at three different ways, or there are many different ways that one could actually estimate it. The, the three that we've looked at is, first of all, our project kicked off with a, a, a survey in the summer of last year in Farmers Weekly, uh, where Farmers Weekly la asked the readership about uh, their frustrations or, or what has worked well in terms of the energy space and had been people, people been dabbling or not. Uh, we got over 700 respondents, uh, and, and, and off those, 38% had invested in a, a huge variety of different technologies and different sizes. And the first thing we did was simply extrapolated that out. If we found, uh, and I forget the exact number, but say 15% of farmers in the survey had invested in a very small 4 kilowatt kit, we extrapolated out and said, well, what would happen if 15% uh, of all farmers were able to put a four, 4 kilowatt uh, solar array on, on their farm? Um, what happens there, you actually get, a, if every farm was able to follow that, that survey, you would get up to 40 gigawatts of installed capacity. And actually, if you restricted ourselves to those farms uh, over 20 hectares, you still get over 20 gigawatts of installed capacity. So we thought that was quite an interesting finding. The main part of the report, however, was geared towards building up some simple scenarios from the ground up, uh, based on the experience of real farmers, uh, to, to come up with some reasonable assumptions about how much um, infrastructure farms could host. So for an, an example there, we went out to see a farm who had a 60 kilowatt array. Um, he was quite adamant that it was on land that he wouldn't be farming anyway. It was an old horse paddock. It was next to buildings. He didn't think he would be able to get any, any uh, agricultural growth in that land. Uh, so he had managed to put a 60 kilowatt uh, array in. Now that made up less than one half percent of his total farm area. So what we did is we've extrapolated that out and said, well, again, what if every farm in the UK was able to dedicate one half of one percent of its land to solar? What do we end up uh, with there? Uh, and I'll show you the, the results of that in the next slide. The other thing we did is we looked at some of the more bullish projections moving forward as to people saying what might be the role of solar in the UK, and then worked back to say, well, uh, that the highest estimate we ever found was, was someone was suggesting that you might end up in a system that had 75 gigawatts of solar uh, in the UK. Um, and then we worked that back to say, well, if we were to go all the way up to 75 gigawatts, how much land would that take up? Uh, and do we think that's a reasonable amount? Um, and uh, if you are to get 75 gigawatts, it comes in at somewhere around 200,000 hectares of land, uh, which is both quite a significant number, but also in the big scheme of things, uh, not that large uh, relative to other land uses uh, that we, we have in society. To go on to our uh, scenarios, um, 
I, I realize this is somewhat informal language, but we've been talking about right from the get-go, we wanted to show that farm-based energy could provide a chunk rather than a sliver of the energy system. Uh, and so these scenarios are all explained in detail in the, in the report. Um, but what we found by extra extrapolating things out, that essentially you quite quickly can find 10 gigawatts of untapped resource across UK farms. And to be honest, you don't have to push things too much further to get up to 20 gigawatts of installed capacity. Uh, and in terms of the total UK installed capacity, once we're talking 20 gigawatts, that is about 20, 21% of total installed capacity. In terms of generation, it's less than that given the mix of uh, um, uh, technologies at play, uh, but you still get around 7% uh, of, of um, total generation. And we think that really is a, a good chunk, and it's something that does uh, should get better support uh, from all sectors of society uh, to achieve that. We also, again reiterating something Ross said, we, we are quite sure that this potential can be met in a manner that complements food production. And we've picked up in three particular areas here that we want to stress. The first is that simply by providing additional income to farmers, uh, we can help build resilience in the food system. Farmers are better, are, will be able to continue to provide us with food if they're able to, uh, to make money. And there are a number of farmers that are actually really struggling just now economically, and the income that can come in from energy generation yet yeah, allows them to enable to keep providing the rest of us with food. The second one that was mentioned is the idea that going down some of these energy systems doesn't involve taking the land out of food production. Now we have unfortunately heard one or two stories of, of uh, farmers that have removed their sheep from lands in order to put solar arrays in. Uh, and on, largely on the basis it seems that no one told them and the developer didn't tell them that it was quite capable of, being, of keeping a sheep in the field as well. Um, so we're really trying to change that, especially getting the developers themselves to, to be much more uh, understanding when they, when they engage with farmers and to think beyond energy in terms of the recommendations. On the other end of that scale, we've also heard stories from farmers reporting that their lambing success has actually gone up where they have combined uh, uh, sheep with, with solar, and that's on the basis of uh, additional shelter, uh, both from wind and also from airborne predators uh, in, in the lambing season. Uh, so there's ways to, to really make that work. Poultry as well is something that can go quite well with ground-based solar, and obviously if we're talking wind and so on, uh, you can carry on farming, whatever you would like underneath that. Uh, the third area that we are really keen to explore is the fact that ground-based solar in particular, but also you can pot potentially go down anaerobic digestion feedstocks that are quite complementary with meadow-based biodiversity. Uh, meadows tend to be where our pollinators live, and given that pollinators are actually important for, for food production, there's an angle there that we think might, might be quite useful go going forward. And the context for that is we're actually, there's now less than 100,000 hectares of flower-rich meadow left in the UK, and that's a 97% 97 reduction since the 1930s. And most of that land has been lost, lost is perhaps the wrong word to use, it has been converted into, um, into agricultural production. And of course that continues to be a threat in these biodiverse habitats, is that a farmer or a landowner often can't make a return from it if, it, if it's kept that way. However, as mentioned, ground-based solar, wind, and even AD can be complementary. So we're really keen moving forward to explore, the way, to explore whether or not farm-based energy might, be the, might become the means with which we as society pay for biodiversity recovery and indeed then pollination services across the UK. Um, another key area we've come up with, uh, we've we realised as part of this project, is that a lot of farm-scale energy systems have many non-energy benefits. And I think the best example in this space is very, very small-scale farm-based anaerobic digestion. And this is anaerobic digestion that's really geared towards slurry management. Um, to be honest, playing with our scenarios, th those, that farm-scale anaerobic digestion is likely to remain a relatively small contributor to the overall um, the UK's overall energy system. However, it's a brilliant little jack-of-all-trades technology uh, that not only provides some energy for the farmer, it has lots of benefits in terms of carbon management, uh, avoided carbon emissions from slurry, uh, help treating, uh, treating slurry, that itself can often help with water pollution prevention and so on. But as things stand, the only mechanism we have in society to, su to support small-scale AD uh, comes from the part of DEC that's interested in energy production. And I think we really need to get this sort of joined up thinking more in play, either from government or from other entities that might be interested in helping farmers invest in this, in this route uh, going forward. Um, our plan moving forward uh, is to continue building a powerful coalition. Uh, if anyone is involved in an organization and wishes to 
to, to get in touch afterwards and, and, and get involved in some way. We would love to hear from you. Um, we have developed a vision for what we would like to see um, in, in terms of the role that farm-based farm uh, energy could play. That's, that's on the next slide. We are also now in the stage where we're trying to create a set of work streams to actually tackle the barriers um, to farm-based energy. Three, we're scoping those out just now and hope with our steering committee to, to determine where we'll go with that early in next year. Three areas that we're particularly focused on. One is the grid connectivity issue and particularly looking into how to spread the cost of grid upgrades such that it's not the next farmer in line that has to pay 100% of the cost of upgrading the grid. Um, the second area we're really interested in is can we actually develop, develop new markets for farm-based energy, and that's looking both at the local area, the local markets, so can, can local communities actually uh, find ways to, to source their electricity direct from the farmers that are in their neighbourhood, but also exploring uh, markets that work up and down the agricultural supply chain. So if a supermarket or a food company is sourcing produce for, from a farmer, uh, is there a way where they could actually end up purchasing energy from them as well, and in return perhaps help with some of the upfront financing or investment in energy systems. Uh, and the third area we're exploring is the idea of maybe looking at regional and community planning as a whole. And that's based on the idea that if you look at the opportunities for an individual farm, we would end up with a different set of solutions than if we perhaps looked at the, the, uh, the opportunities for a group of farms in a particular area. And then the options might change again if we started looking at uh, not just energy, but uh, a variety of different environmental services across a region. And we're keen to explore whether that might work in practice. Um, we have created our vision for farm power in 2020. Again, that was released publicly uh, two Fridays ago. Those are the, the entities that have signed up thus far. Those are organizations that have actually been involved in the project uh, uh, thus far. Our, the, the plan is to actually build as much support for this vision as possible. I realize it's not, it's not particularly legible in the, in the current form, but please, if you are interested, go and have a look at that. Um, it re largely reiterates a lot of the things I've been telling you about t today. We think there's a lot of potential. We think that it can be met in a way that complements food production. We need to think about co-benefits, and we would like to move towards uh, a regulatory system that supports that in its, in its whole. And uh, that is everything from me for now. Thanks for listening. Thanks very much, Ian. Lots of food for thought there. Um, and uh, it's worth me just reminding listeners that they can submit questions at any time using the button at the bottom of the screen. And also um, just letting you know that you'll be able to listen again to this chat. Um, uh, uh, it will be made available, um, and you'll get information from the organisers on how to do that. Um, so if, you, if there's an important point you've missed this time, you'll be able to re-listen. And now let me hand on to our third speaker, who is uh, Jay Matha, and he's going to talk about some, uh, some real-world examples of how this has happened. Jay. Hello. Thank you very much. Um, my focus here is going to be to talk about what the numbers look like for various different systems. This is sort of a crash course, if you will. Um, we are uh, a renewable energy systems integration specialist. So what we do is we focus on finding out how one system and another system and another system can help each other. So it's, in our eyes, not about one or two bells and whistles. It's about how they all synergize together to make each other more efficient. Um, and one of the things that uh, I wanted to talk about right away is energy reduction, because there's been a lot of talk, of course, about energy production. But reducing energy requirements is an area that needs to be within the energy hierarchy, the first thing that's done. Um, and you might have heard of voltage optimization. This is a technology which is fairly bedded down in the UK already. There's over 3,000 installs. Um, what this system effectively does is it takes the incoming voltage from 240 volts and steps it down to 221, 222. Um, and the net effect of that is an average of 8 to 9% energy reduction across the site that's voltage optimized with the knock-on benefits of managing harmonics and uh, transients within the electricity supply. So effectively what this, this sort of a system does, it's a fit and forget technology at the incoming mains that reduces energy consumption but also protects all the pieces of kit further down the line that get burnt out because of surges 
Um, typically, as I said, we're 240 volts, but there are plenty of occurrences in the UK where you can have 260 volts. Um, and at 260 volts, for instance, an average incandescent light bulb will have 40% the lifespan that it would at 240 volts. So it burns things out and consumes more power. AD is something we have heard already about. Uh, looking at here an example of a 100 kilowatt system. Um, costs 100 kilowatts to, uh, to cost 540,000 pounds to install a system like this. Uh, annual revenues uh, 83,450. So offering a six and a half year payback, 15 and a half percent return on investment, which is just looking at the energy production. So this excludes the added value from waste management. This is purely looking at the energy by itself. And it's good to see what some of the numbers look like. Uh, and a 100 kilowatt system is not a very large system. Uh, it's the type that has been mentioned beforehand as being fairly readily available in a wide variety of circumstances in agricultural situations. Um, moving on to look at wind. Um, wind is obviously a, quite a contentious issue in the UK, especially because of visual impact, uh, but it's always good to look at the numbers. And what we're looking at here is if four of these 800 kilowatt turbines were installed on six, 76 meter tall masts, you'd be looking at around 4 million pound install price, uh, average revenue 710,000, so a 5.7 year payback, 17.5% return on investment. So it, it's demonstrating how attractive these systems can be. This is in typical wind in the UK at about 5 meters per second, 5.5 meters per second at hub height. Um, and to put things in perspective, an average power line is about 33 meters in height. So this is about twice as high as an average power line. So it's, it's not a huge system. Um, but I also wanted to demonstrate that bigger is better financially. If you look at a 2.3 megawatt turbines, put two of those installed instead, who would produce the same amount of power over the year as the four 800 kilowatt turbines, the price goes up a little bit. Uh, but the revenue increases proportionally even more, so you knock a year off the payback period. So a 21% return on investment. And this is why, if people are able to get through the entire procedure, and planning is the biggest issue with this, um, you can see that it's quite attractive. Uh, going smaller scale to uh, medium scale wind turbines, um, these uh, are mounted on 30 meter mass, so you're looking at a system that's the size uh, effectively of a power line, large scale power line. Two of these 250 kilowatt systems, 587,000 pounds, but offering 4.3 year paybacks. Now that would offset 315 tons of carbon, so it's, it's a significant amount. Um, that uh, nacelle, the centerpiece that says Wes on it, that's in blue, is about the size of a compact car just to give perspective. Um, these sort of systems are fairly easy uh, to install because they have much less of a visual impact and a 250 kilowatt system is a lot easier to get into most grids than the larger scale systems as which was discussed previously. A project we've been working on for about five years is a large scale biomass uh, electricity generation system um, and this is a six megawatt power plant, it's electric only, not heat, uh, but 16 million pound system, annual revenues of 3 million pounds, offering a 5.3 year payback period. One of the other key points there is the 21 permanent jobs created. So instead of just powering uh, the grid, it's also generating significant amounts of potential benefit to the local economy. Um, this system is a WID compliance, which means waste industry directive. Uh, effectively, what that means is it can burn waste wood. So the majority of the feedstocks for this sort of a system would be construction waste. Um, so it's turning a problem that we have, whereas a lot of waste wood is going into the landfill, um, and turning that instead into part of the solution. And right now, we're looking at a system like this for a community in Kent, um, and it would offset the, the same carbon as roughly around 5,000 households. So this community is able to generate, because it's only got 1,500 households, uh, pretty much able to offset all of the carbon emissions for the entire town over the entire year, over everything that it does, including its food, including its transport, including its energy. Now, biomass has uh, been mentioned as well, uh, simple basic technology in essence, burning wood materials, uh, usually wood materials to generate heat. 
Um, payback periods have become incredibly attractive, uh, typically four to five years. So they can offer incredible returns these days uh, because the renewable heat incentive is incredibly financially advantageous. There are issues that need to be thought about with this sort of a system because control over fuel supply price is something that could be um, a variable that is unknown. Uh, if too many biomass systems get installed, then there will be increased pressure and competition for that wood fuel, which could easily drive the price up. So that is just one of the variables that needs to be considered, um, and obviously that is going to be location-specific in many ways. Unfortunately, for the renewable heat incentive, which pays you to generate heat from systems like this, you can't burn your own wood unless it meets a, quite a number of strict quality control and sustainability criteria. So farmers who are thinking, well, I can chip my own trees and burn them in my own boiler. Well, you could, but you won't get the renewable heat incentive unless they comply. So what's happening now is uh, we've worked on a project with a farmer who is selling his waste wood to a chip manufacturer who has all the certifications in place, and then he's getting them back at a, a significantly reduced rate. So in essence, he is sort of fueling himself, but it's via a third party. Now we've heard a bit about solar. Um, this is just a crash course solar slide, which is basically there's three main types of PV, um, photovoltaic. We have thin film, we have polycrystalline, and we have monocrystalline. Now thin film requires about 15 to 20 square meters of roof area or land area for one kilowatt of output, whereas polycrystalline requires about eight square meters and monocrystalline, about seven square meters. So you can see the level of efficiency. Monocrystalline is the most efficient solar system. Now, typical payback, six to seven years these days. Uh, solar has become quite attractive. You can get that down even as much as low as five years in certain circumstances. Um, and large scale, uh, solar often is in that sort of payback period. Um, but of course, it's grid dependent. So the grid upgrades. Uh, can be gigantic in price. In fact, the, the grid is often the limiting factor, as was mentioned previously, and it, it, it has uh, killed probably about 25% of the projects we've worked at uh, because the, the grid upgrade costs were so excessive that it would never make it viable. So you can move something that has a six or seven year payback to 15 year payback if it happens to be in a, in a poor grid location. Um, some areas of the UK, like Norfolk, are very, very difficult to install anything of significant solar-wise because the grid needs significant improvements. Um, and uh, as the previous speaker mentioned, it's, it seems that we've got this about face because whoever it is that wants to improve it is expected to take on that burden when, in fact, it, it needs to be balanced. Now, we've got also solar thermal or solar hot water. Uh, there's two systems. Uh, we have evacuated tube and flat plate. Under uh, current uh, payback periods are roughly eight to six years, dependent on circumstances, sometimes as long as 10. The main difference between evacuated tube and flat pl plate is that evacuated tube have a higher thermal output in the winter time um, and a higher peak temperature, whereas flat plate have a, a higher output in the summertime and a lower peak temperature. But if you average them out over the whole year, both systems produce roughly the same amount of kilowatts of thermal energy. Um, and this is a technology that we brought to the marketplace. It's called photovoltaic thermal, PVT. Uh, and what, what it is, is, in essence, is a solar panel that produces heat and electricity at the same time. Um, one of the biggest challenges in the solar marketplace is that the hotter a PV panel gets, the lower its outputs. It's a resistor. It's uh, basic physics. And um, wha what this system does is it takes that problem and turns it into a solution. If you remove the heat from the solar panel, you end up increasing the electricity outputs uh, by sometimes as much as 20% in the UK. So you can end up having a dual benefit. It also offers a significant improvement on energy density. So for the same square meter of roof area, as much as four times as much energy can be produced if you're looking at just simple PV. Uh, so the, we have two different systems, the power volt panel, and I'll talk about the next panel on the next slide. Uh, but basically, it produces 200 watts of electricity and 460 watts of thermal energy. Um, they have a higher electric yield, as I said, 20% roughly on average. Um, they're applicable in low temp applications, so this system does not produce high temp. It's, it's 45 
degrees, typically 50 degrees. So in buildings that are looking at a low temp requirement or a hot water requirement, um, these sort of applications are perfect. Um, and including space heating, if it was done with low temp radiators or underfloor heating systems, then it works too. Um, and in, it's a great system for preheating other systems like heat pumps, which is what I will go into sh shortly. Now the power therm, which is the other form of uh, PVT, is more thermally biased. It produces 180 watts of electric, so less electricity, but significantly more heat. Um, and it has uh, similar electric yield to normal PV and low to mid temperature range applications. This would l typically be applied where there was a significant amount of thermal energy required. Now what we've also developed here is a novel hybrid heat pump because there's a variety of different heat pumps, um, water source, ground source, and air source. Air source is the least efficient. Uh, ground source is the next most efficient. Then water source is the most efficient. And the best way to summarize that I always find is mentioning that if you had a tw your hand in 20 degree air, it feels warm, even though we are significantly hotter. And that's because heat is poorly thermally conducted through air. If you put your hand in 20 degrees earth, it would feel cool because the heat is being wicked away from your body. And if you put your hand in 20 degree water, it feels cold because water is even more efficient. Now you reverse that concept with a heat pump. You can take the heat out of those different mediums and put them into a building. So in effect, a reverse fridge because a fridge is a heat pump. Um, and what we've done here is combine together PVT or solar thermal with a heat pump uh, that we designed ourselves so you can get ground and water source sort of returns and outputs out of the system with um, a multi-income. So basically a heat pump that can sit there and take its heat as a primary incoming point from the PVT, or it could take it from the air, or it could take it from the ground. Um, and then you end up in a situation where you have significant increases in performance. So basically what you end up with is a thing called a COP, a coefficient of performance. And what that is on this slide, 4.06, that basically means for every one kilowatt of electricity in, you get 4.06 kilowatts of heat out. And because the renewable heat incentive pays you for the heat that comes out of the heat pump, you can get a significant improvement and a PVT system in conjunction with this sort of a system is getting a feed-in tariff from the electricity produced, it's getting a renewable heat incentive from the solar thermal energy coming out of the PVT panel, and it's getting a renewable heat incentive from the heat pump. So that's why you're multiple benefits. Now that said, in domestic applications in the UK, the solar thermal elements of the PVT is not supported at this current time, but in commercial applications it is. So therefore, almost every agricultural circumstance. And we've also developed another system, um, which is basically looking at preheating the ground, because ground storage with uh, a PVT system makes complete sense. And in essence, this is a graph showing you the ground temperature um, throughout the year, and the temperature drops as low as 5 degrees and goes up to as high as 13 degrees in this application. And you're seeing the seasons there. So in the summertime, the ground's a little bit warmer. In the winter, it's a little bit colder. But it's not a significant amount of variation. And if you can put heat into the ground, you get this uplift. That's what the, the orange bit is. So that uplift continues gradually over seasons to grow even larger and larger and larger. So in effect, if you could imagine, the next slide is showing an earth energy bank, which is, in essence, putting that heat into the ground underneath a building in its foundations. So you have interseasonal heat storage or a thermal battery underneath a new build building. So it builds the heat up over time, and then you use the heat pump to pull that heat out of the ground when you need it. So in effect, you take summertime heat and you store it until winter. And we've always historically had that challenge. We produce the most heat when we don't need it, and we produce the least heat when we need it the most. And solar has obviously been sitting on the polar opposite curve of demand in that regard. So what this does is it enables the benefits of the sun to be extended into the time when you need it the most, which is in the winter. So you can get the COPs of four out of a heat pump coming out of this system in the middle of the night in the coldest night of the year. And here's a little case study example of a large heated agricultural building 
where we went in there and looked at it and looked at a whole bunch of energy saving measures at the top and basically found for about 33,889 pounds, they could save 10,846 pounds a year. So a 3.1 year payback period. And voltage optimization in there had a 2.8 year payback, but there was also LED lighting upgrades, there were control systems installed and timer switches, and then the renewables below it, uh, installing a combined heat and power plant that ran off of natural gas, uh, had a five and a half year payback, and then a PVT system, a large 48 kilowatt system with a heat pump. That was 225 odd thousand pounds, but it made 51,000 a year, a 4.4 year payback. So an aggregate of this whole example, it shows that you can get 22.5% return on investment on a combination of various factors with a net carbon saving of 61% in this regard. Now, any, any questions? I think that starts to come now, but uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Jay. That's very informative uh, and, and a, a, a great amount of detail there. And I, it's probably worth me reminding um, people listening that they can uh, look again at the slides and hear the presentations again, and you'll hear from the organizers about that. Uh, we've obviously got a very well-informed uh, group of people listening, so um, uh, I've got some useful information from Mark Richmond. Thanks for this, uh, Mark. He says that um, uh, Ross noted in his first presentation that feasibility is and, and carrying out feasibility studies is, is, is very important and also quite pricey. Um, and uh, Mark says um, uh, that the government's delivery body on waste and renewables, which is known as RAP, W-R-A-P, has grant funding for farms, uh, which allows up to £10,000 per farm for anaerobic digestion feasibility studies. And I believe that the web address for RAP is uh, www.wrap. Dot org dot uk. Uh, so good luck with that. Um, and now we're going to move straight on to questions. Um, and we do have some coming in, but uh, you're quite welcome to add more questions uh, as they arise. Um, just use the button at the bottom of the screen. And one question, one issue that we've we've had several questions around is the dual use of land. Um, how you can um, uh, put together things like PV and animals. And we have heard something about that already today um, from, from Ian. So um, perhaps, um, Ian, I could come to you first and see if you wanted to just expand on that a little bit. Um, and I'll also give uh, Ross and, uh, and Jay an opportunity to pitch, on it, pitch in on that as well, because I can see uh, from what they've said this afternoon that they've got some thoughts, they might have some thoughts on that. So, uh, Ian, any thoughts on that? Uh, dual use of land, um, using, for example, PV and combining it with animals, or 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 any other kind of combination of the of the the, the different land uses. Yeah, um, I guess just to reiterate, first of all, that uh, the, the, there's all sorts of potential for dual use of, of land, and it's really quite unfortunate that the debate is framed so often as food versus energy or food versus fuel, rather than food and fuel and food and energy and indeed food and energy and ecosystem services and biodiversity and recreation and everything else and you know, I might be pushing it a bit there to suggest we can get uh, all those many things off, off one piece of land but the idea that we can only get one I think it is it, you, you can disprove that quite practically um, in practice, I, I, I go back to the examples I gave earlier that we've heard both from, particularly on, with combining sheep production with uh, ground-based solar, is that in practice we've heard both very good stories and where actually the farmer has benefited from lamb lambing success, but also negative stories where a farmer just didn't realise that the two could be combined so went ahead and took a sheep off the land. Um, I think it essentially comes down to getting more information out there for farmers to realise that there are options for them to combine. And, and I think also for developers of energy solutions to, to also um, skill themselves up to not just have energy skills but to be aware that if they are putting energy into an agricultural context that they can actually look for those co-benefits themselves. And certainly a number of developers are already uh, um, really pushing that already. So I, would, I think there's, there's lessons uh, for, for, for farmers themselves to always look for those opportunities, but also for the energy pr provision community um, to also look for the benefits there and to uh, provide advice to farmers that those co that dual use can be found. 
Thanks, Ian. Uh, Jay, perhaps I can come back to you on that next, because uh, certainly some of the examples that you've put forward have got uh, joint use in one way or another, but um, uh, would you like to, to bring the agriculture use into that as well? Any thoughts? Um, uh, uh. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's, it is uh, something that I would completely agree uh, with the previous speaker. It's In the end of the day, I think we've overly simplified things in some ways that it is an either-or situation. It's always an and, um, in to some degree or another, in every circumstance. Uh, you know, there are so many agricultural sheds out there that have gigantic roofs that are doing nothing other than sheltering what's underneath it, when in fact they should all be generating power. Um, I, I still find it quite shocking that we give planning permission for new agricultural buildings that don't have power production. It, it's, it's just really strange because it's about systems integration at every stage. Um, there is a, a solar farm project that I was working on a few years ago with chickens um, being used on a field. So they under, directly underneath the actual uh, frames of the of the solar panels, they had uh, chicken runs. Um, so they, they had integrated the two together really beautifully, and then on top of that, they also had sheep grazing in between the actual solar panels. So you had a, had a three-input system with two different agricultural outputs plus power production. So the, it is entirely feasible to do so on a regular basis, and, and I would agree with the agricultural uh, combination with biodiversity and ecosystem services and uh, tourism. Uh, in the end of the day, uh, this stuff is all going to grow and grow. We're going to have more and more of this throughout the world because we have become largely inefficient in many ways, and this is about that transition. Thanks, Jay. And Ross, do you think that your members realise that this is a, the, the possibility for a, a portfolio of uses rather than, uh, than either or? or? Uh, Janet, thank you. Uh, I do think there are many farmers out there who, who d don't miss an opportunity to make uh, two forms of income from one piece of land. Um, but d three quick points on what Ian has said. Firstly, um, we've been told by the Secretary of State that uh, farmers won't be eligible for single farm payment if they're getting uh, a rent from a solar developer. So that is just something to factor in. Don't go into this with your eyes closed. Secondly, someone has got to be uh, eligible for paying business rates uh, and farmers need to be uh, quite clear that the uh, agreement they have with their developer is structured uh, so that the person who's paying it knows about it. And thirdly, there are inheritance tax considerations. And to Jane, Jay's point about roofs, uh, I completely agree about all these farm buildings um, and dual use of those roofs. What I'm hoping is that the uh, technology will improve shortly so that your um, solar material actually will be your roof material. So it's dual purpose and, and, and that really is the holy grail which which is where we're getting to actually um you know we're only a few years away in the uk from grid parity on solar and fossil fuels even without support so um there are a lot of new technologies being developed at the moment which are roofs they are not on roofs or part of a roof they are the roof because that's the that's the perfect thing to do absolutely okay thanks all of you and, and i would say talking about the, the rooftop solar um, issue particularly, that now is probably a very good time to investigate that because that's where uh, government grants are focused at the moment on the um, uh, and, and, and government support mechanisms for PV on the rooftop solar. So that's probably some uh, a good time to investigate that. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, and another question that we have had, actually, I think that we have to grapple with this, and that's the, the issue about um, uh, the, aesthetic, the aesthetics of, um, of putting um, renewables onto agricultural land um, and and using all of these different solutions. Um, Jay, I, I, I know you, you, you mentioned that it, 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 the, the tourism aspect. Um, mm -hmm. how, how do you think um, the recreational users of this land will, will react to having, having, this, um, having, having these facilities on it? Uh, Ross, do you want to pick up on that one? Yes, I'd be delighted to. I mean, if it only it were as, as simple as, as the theory that, that Jay puts forward um, were the reality. I mean, it, it isn't. You know, we, the, the British countryside is multifaceted. Uh, it's different around every bend. Uh, it's incredibly beautiful. Uh, and we all own it. Uh, we all own a or, or we think we own a view and have a, an entitlement to express a view. And so technologies like wind power can be extremely controversial. Um, and uh, it, it, my membership is completely divided on the issue of wind. Some uh, are great supporters of it, and, and some just 
don't like it at all. Um, and, and so I, I think the issue of uh, capacity, which Ian raised in his excellent presentation, is, is one which needs to be tempered with reality about uh, how many uh, different technologies really have the capacity to be brought forward uh, because of planning restrictions and, at the end of the day, personal views about acceptability in the landscape. Mm -hmm. Ian, did you want to pitch in on that one? Um, yeah, I, I, and I, I, again, there's no getting around the fact that it, it, it is tricky uh, with wind just now. A question that we posed in a report, and I don't think we have the answer to it yet, is, is the idea of sort of scattered individual turbines on farms more acceptable to society than the idea of large wind farms dominating landscapes? And um, I don't know the answer to that, but I think that is quite an active it's an interesting question to explore, and I guess I'd like to think that the idea of uh, a farm having one or two turbines on it is, is perhaps less intrusive in the landscape than, than an entire hillside being covered in turbines. Uh, but there's no pretending it isn't a sort of toxic environment for wind just now, and a lot of people have made up their minds one way or the other, and... Um, Yes, there's, there's no point pretending that doesn't exist. One, one thing I would say in that getting beyond wind, though, and that the solar, um, ground-based solar obviously can have visual impact as well, and we're starting to see some animosity in certain areas towards that as well. But we've also seen examples of um, uh, ground-based solar where there's been quite effective screening put in. Uh, and then when we go back to co-benefits as well, I, I talked largely about the potential benefits around meadow-based uh, 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 habitats that can, can go in and, and amongst the, um, the, the solar PV, but you, you, there's also potential to help us develop hedgerow uh, uh, habitats as well as screening around um, solar. And we've had one or two developers who have actually, that we've spoken to, who've very much gone down that route and have said, you know, we don't get any objections in this farm because actually no one knows that it's there because we've designed it in the first place such that it's not visible. Um, so there's certainly, again, don't want to pretend the issue isn't there, but I think there are some creative solutions um, for us, not just in terms of um, picking the right sites in the first place, but also in terms of when, once we do have a site, uh, trying to, again, not just thinking of the, the energy production potential, but thinking of that amongst some of these other um, attributes that we're all concerned about in society and actually putting that into play. Well, and I would also add in there that the greatest level of support for wind turbines in the United Kingdom is people who live the closest to them, and the least, least level of support is people who live the furthest away. Um, in many ways, we're, we're sort of 20 years behind what a lot of European countries have been doing in this sector. The France, for many years, stuck wind turbines in its national parks in order to pay and finance the national park's maintenance. Um, so people there have grown used to seeing these sort of pieces of technology in those environments because they understand that's what makes those environments financially feasible. Um, we've got a, quite a big separation with our NIMBYism, and I would actually go, it's bananaism. It's it build absolutely nothing anywhere near anyone. That, that's sort of the sector we have taken, that approach. And as we're seeing the increasing demands on our country and the greater impacts of things like climate change and, and economic security and energy security and food security mean we have to actually in many ways look at, the, look at our environment differently than we have, just like they did in World War II. The country changed very quickly overnight to becoming a massive food producer because it had to. In many ways, we're going to have to do something similar with food and energy because we've got a lot of issues with our intrinsic systems that are not holding up to the changes that are coming. Well, um, uh, you might be interested to know that um, in, at, in, in New Power, we actually did some research last month as to the kind of energy infrastructure which people would find acceptable within five miles of their home. And uh, solar PV came out on top with about 70% of people finding it acceptable. Wind turbines actually were not very far behind it. About 60% of people said that they would find that uh, acceptable. Um, mm. And uh, energy from waste was not far behind that either on about, uh, on about uh, 50 about 50 percent, I think. So people, I think there is a, there is, um, a certain amount of acceptance that, that these things are going to be required. Um, mm -hmm. Now, let me move on slightly um, and ask a little bit about perhaps some of the, um, the economic side of it. Um, and, uh, and it's quite a practical question. How much of your power do you think ought to be used on site and how much exported to the grid? How, how, or, uh, or how much of the energy ought to be used on site and how much exported? Uh, are we looking at this as, a, um, as an export business or as something that will underpin the farm itself? Um, who, who would like to have a go at that? Um, Jay, how about you? 
Sure. Um, I mean, it's it's a very it's a difficult question to answer because obviously it depends on the circumstance and what the individual wants from the environment. Um, we try to get as much on-site use as possible because that has the best returns. Um, if you are exporting energy to the grid, you make 4.77 pence per kilowatt hour. If you offset buying energy from the grid, you're saving between 10 and 12, usually, pence per kilowatt hour. So it's much, much better if you use that power on-site financially. Uh, but that said, um, our farms are producing goods and services for our communities, and I view this as just another exported product for them. They're exporting electricity or heat. Well, that's just another thing. They're growing energy as opposed to just growing food. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Ian, did you want to pick up on that? Uh, not, not much to add, really. Um, again, a lot of it depends on the local context and the technology that's been applied, and sometimes the farmer will be able to use it on site, and I would agree whenever it can be used on site, it probably should, because that's the, the, the economics work best in that way. But, but sometimes, depending on the technology, you might be producing at times when there isn't a demand on site. Um, and, and I guess until, until perhaps local or smaller scale storage solutions uh, get up and running, then it, it's, it's good to have that backup. So, um, yeah, that, that it, it, in some ways it does, it does depend on the farmer, but I'd imagine purely for, for economic reasons that the focus is likely to be an on-site use first. Okay, thanks. Uh, a couple of quite detailed questions here, and we're, we're, we're running out of time actually, so I'm going to make these the last questions, and they're, they're, they're slightly out of our mainstream. Um, well, first of all, one is asking um, how much heat you could take out of um, an AD uh, uh, stack uh, to, to use the heat on its own. Uh, before the heat needed to keep the AD going, would be, the, the biological activity there would begin to suffer. Um, and uh, our second question um, is about something uh, slightly different. How can we incentivize farmers to consider carbon sequestration in the soil and long-term soil soil health. Now, I'm wondering um, whether, in some cases, uh, the addition of, of, um, of renewables can, be, uh, can help to improve long-term so soil health by providing an, uh, an income from an area that, that can then be left unplowed. Um, but I'll give everybody a chance to answer those two questions and, and also make some final comments if they want to um, before we wrap up. And we, ha we are out of time, so I'll actually ask you to be quite quick. Um, um, Jade, would you like to go first? I'll take you in reverse order. Um, yeah, how much heat you can get out of an AD system before it starts to affect the reaction. Um, it really is dependent on what type of AD system, what the feedstock is. Um, some feedstocks are, have a higher level of exothermic reaction. They produce more energy. Um, and it depends, really. It's complicated. But uh, you can pull 80 degrees out of, a, out of an AD system. It just, it's, it's not about peak temperature. It's about total kilowatts. Um, your total kilowatt consumption, roughly 15, 20% of what it can produce without causing typically any issues. But with that said, you produce biogas, which you can burn and produce heat at any time as well. So you can get, there's two ways of getting heat out of AD, direct and then burning it. So you, you have that double whammy. Um, when it comes to soil improvements and, and, and secondary benefits like that, uh, carbon sequestration in the soil, I, I, I think in the end of the day, um, most of the agricultural soil in the UK has collapsed if you look at it from an ecological basis because it's been stripped of its resources and it's been had to be stocked up with external fertilizers uh, for a very long time. Um, the reality is if you leave soil alone in certain circumstances, it can start to recover. So. It, it, it only serves that if we were able to ter return as much soil as we can to natural meadows, then you're allowing a natural system to maintain itself in the way that it's designed to do so. If you strip stuff out of a soil permanently, you, you basically destroy the soil. And, and most agricultural fields in the UK that are intensively farmed have less biodiversity than a parking lot. Okay, thanks, Jay. I'm not sure that Ross is going to agree with you on that, but I will. Uh, <laughs> let me uh, come to Ian, uh, Ian now. And, and, and Ian, while you're um, answering, um, I think we've had a question about the name of the report um, that you mentioned, so you might like to just um, remind people of what that report was called. Thanks for that. The, the report is called Exploring the Size of the Prize, and if you go into the Forum for the Future website, which is simply forum 
forthefuture.org. And uh, I've, 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 in the, quick, the q and I've actually copied and pasted the link. It will be the project is called Farm Power, and if you go to the Farm Power project page, you will find a link to that report uh, and to the vision as well. Um, just as a closing comment, I'd, I'd pick up on the carbon sequestration one, and I think it's sort of the key question of, and I would say not just carbon sequestration, we've been talking throughout this call about the potential co-benefits that come along with, with energy. So it's, it could be soil health, it could be biodiversity, it could be water management, it could be slurry management, and the trouble we have just now is our policy levers tend to focus on one piece of the puzzle and we haven't yet got the proper joined up thinking uh, that, that rewards uh, technologies or approaches that tick boxes across all of those areas. You tend to have one part of government that's particularly focused on one area and is just looking at that and isn't incentivized to think about the others. Um, I think we have to try and change that. We'll be trying to change that as part of the project. We're also trying to think about entities other than government that might have something to uh, 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 might want to benefit or, or support that sort of thinking. So we know at Forum, for example, that a lot of a number of the big supermarkets or the food companies now are at least talking a very good game about uh, supply chain carbon, working with their suppliers to, to reduce impact, whether it's water impact or um, uh, uh, carbon impact and, and so on. And so we're keen to explore as part of this project the role of those companies to actually help farmers come up with um, more integrated uh, solutions. I'll leave it there. Okay, great. Um, and finally, I'll have to just come to uh, Ross, and I'll have to ask you to be quick, and I, I think you'll need to go out to your um, members and, and uh, help them to deli deliver this now. Uh, but I'm like very grateful, Janet. Words. Yeah, I, I, I don't recognize Jay's commentary. Uh, I was particularly pleased with what Ian said. He, he recognized some of the solutions. Uh, what CLA has done is, is produced a scheme for landowners, land managers, to actually count how much carbon is being sequestered on their farms. It's called CALM, Carbon Accounting for Land managers it's on our website cla.org.uk uh, and I'd encourage any farmer and, and landowner to actually scientifically look at his use of carbon. Carbon sequestration uh, is something we, we have to recognize and deal with. Um, higher level stewardship schemes uh, through the reform cap uh, are there to encourage people to do it uh, and there is a certain amount of uh, financial support going forward uh, and uh, just going back to the one technology which I think is particularly attractive anaerobic, anaerobic digestion and I think the use of digestate on, on our land is, is a particularly good uh, co-product. But um, yes, I, I, think, I think carbon sequestration is something we have to take very seriously, uh, look at good advice, good practice, uh, and move it forward in a positive spirit. Okay, that's great. Thanks very much, Ross. Well, I'm sorry to rush you on what was obviously a very interesting and very live discussion, but unfortunately we have to wind it up there. Um, those listening to the webinar will be able to re-listen and you'll hear from the organisers about that. But, uh, but uh, for now, I'd like to say thanks very much um, uh, and we'll see you another time.